So welcome to Cape Dialogue, Chicago Arts Partnerships and Education's monthly or almost monthly series of online conversations on art and pedagogy. Cape is a nonprofit arts organization that provides young people access to critical arts practice through arts integrated programs throughout uh, public schools in Chicago and underserved regional suburbs. We work with teacher and artist collaborate, collaborators to reimagine re what arts practice could look like in the classroom, working with teams to develop arts projects as curriculum that engage students in grappling with the connections and tensions between academic content areas and material exploration to reach new understandings about the world. Today's conversation, what is publicness? revolves around how we come to understand the public spheres as spaces for socializing, sharing, and learning during COVID-19 and the increased reliance on technology for daily social interactions and educative exchange. Technology's role in shaping the public sphere is not new. We could look at how mapping has altered perceptions of the world and the construction of otherness and then there's the advent of film, how the moving image augmented time and sequence, and now it has engendered digital witnesses. Perhaps we should see beyond the novelty of techno-social spaces, considering how those virtual spaces have seeped into our daily lives during lockdown. From our sofas, dining and kitchen tables, dens, living rooms and basements, we take classes, make art, work on spreadsheets, write reports, work alone, meet with colleagues and socialize online. The context of the different spaces we work in, learn and co-mingle have collapsed. And at the same time, we can access geographically dispersed cultural communities through online partnerships. What do we make of the blurred distinction between public and private? How are artists, curators, and educators responding to shifts in publicness? How can these artistic responses shape how we interact in techno-social learning spaces? I'm pleased to introduce our amazing panelists today. These individuals inhabit many roles in their work and can provide an expansive discussion on publicness in the context of archive, geography, and site. Sanaz Sarabi, born in Tehran, is a research-based artist filmmaker and essayist. Her work at large engages with the politics of recovery in photographic archives and the role of photography and film as technologies of public making and subject positioning navigating the archival condition vis-a-vis -vis the image dispositif. Sarabi's work seeks to unearth and map the structures wherein ideological formations emerge as nodes and spaces of spectatorship, visuality, and erasure. Sarabi's work has screened and exhibited internationally at Video Now 16 at Kunstmuseum Bonn, Germany, Montreal International Documentary Film Festival, RIDM, European Media Arts Festival, Osnabrück, Kassler Duckfest, Germany, and the Athens International Film and Video Festival, to name a few. Sarabi is currently based in Chicago, where she is writing her doctoral dissertation at the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Society and Cultural uh, and Culture, Montreal. Then we'll have Abe Odunlami, uh, PhD, is a cultural theorist and curator specializing in contemporary urban history and visual culture. Odun Lamy's research analyzes the socio-political nature of urban societies and infrastructures by analyzing the paradoxical nature of the avant-garde, hierarchical, hierarchical structures within conspicuous consumption practices, and post-colonial globality. Through this work, he examines the interdependencies that form conditions that produce the techne of and inform the built environment. 
Odun Lamy is based in Berlin and is a lecturer at uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And then Trisha Van Eck, who will join us, uh, at, will be the last speaker. She is a former associate curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, curating exhibitions there for 13 years. Van Eck then founded 6018 North, an art space that is in what is a former residential home in the Edgewater community of Chicago. With 1618 North, with 6018 North, excuse me, Van Eck creates an experimental cultural space that, that increases opportunities, visibility, and audiences for Chicago artists. She has curated over 70 exhibitions at the MCA and much of her curatorial projects were engaged in interactive, um, a formal series of artists and audience activations as a companion to Without You I'm Nothing, Art and His Audience, Jan Tichy's Tish, project, Cabrini Green, Theaster Gates' Temple Exercises, and Tino Segal's Kiss, to name a few. She curated presentations of the work of Buckminster Fuller, Gary James Marshall, and other Chicago artists, as well as emerging Chicago artists through the MCA's UBS 12 by 12, New Artists, New Work Exhibitions. All right, with that, I'll hand it over to Sana Saravi. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good to see you all. Um, old and new faces, thank you so much for tuning in today. I know everyone has a level of Zoom fatigue at the moment, um, over a year into the pandemic, so we really appreciate it. I'm going to share my screen. Do you see it all right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good to go. Yes. Perfect. Just don't see my my mouse, but <laughs> it's okay. All right. Um, so thank you, Mark, um, and everyone at Cape uh, for having me. I'm gonna put a timer to be a good presenter and don't go over my time. And. Um, Thank you so much for all the labor behind organizing this event. Uh, it's really nice uh, to be involved with, um, with you guys, to be in a conversation with, um, um, with everyone. I think it's going to be a really fantastic panel. Um, today, I am presenting my, um, my work under the, under the rubric of documents and monuments. And um, when Mark um, told me about the idea about around the notion of publicness, I immediately was drawn to my current research project, which is part of my PhD around uh, the colonial archives of oil, oil production in Iran, where I'm from. And um, really thinking about um, um, coloniality and publicness in, within the space of archive and how that is translated through different material and immaterial and psychological um, spaces and forms. Um, I will be uh, partly showing um, some of the archival resources that I have like original archives and also excerpts from my um, recent mid-length film titled One Image to Act which um, you see here, um, a video still. Um, so I will be reading some of citations from my own text and also going through the excerpts from the film with, this, uh, with the voice of the film and without it so I can um, get more done with the time that we have. Oh, oh there we go. Um, I like to start my presentation with this, um, uh, with this quote. Um, by Antonio Gramsci. Um, I'm sorry, I have to stop because, um, okay, there we go. Sorry, um, there we go. Um, 
I want to start my presentation with this uh, quote from Antonio Gramsci, in which he indicates the need for an inventory of traces, a repertoire with which one can recognize the self and critically reflect upon the historical processes which have preceded one's present day condition of existence. He says, the starting point of critical elaboration is the consciousness of what uh, one really is and is knowing yourself as a product of the historical processes to date, which has deposited in you an infinity of traces without leaving an inventory. Therefore, it is imperative at the outset to compile such an inventory. While working on this project for the past four years as part of my doctoral project, I have often thought of this inventory, the archive, or the repertoire as an accumulation of traces, specters, or ghosts. Those which refuse to simply depart, to permanently land, or to offer fixed sets of meanings. On one hand, I ask myself, what does it mean to have traces, but not an inventory, or to have a history without, uh, without documents, to quote Omni al Shokri, um, who is a historian. I don't know why my keynote doesn't go forward. There we go. While on the other hand, as an authorized institution guarded this space, colonial and imperial practice, and what it contains, the colonial archives of oil production in Iran, currently owned by the British Petroleum BP, functions as a catalyst for organizing vision and as a technology of total surveillance encompassing oil workers' private and public life. BP, um, all of us know <laughs> um, um, the corporation, it's very active, especially in south side of Chicago. There's a one of the largest BP refineries uh, bordering Chicago and um, south side Chicago and Indiana. So I think it becomes all more interesting for us to know a little more about the history of BP um, as this colonial enterprise. Um, I hear sort of like quickly cap um, some of the important um, hi historical facts about BP um, as it was established in Iran in 1908 as Anglo-Persian oil company and then um, until its um, nationalization of, um, of the industry in Iran in 1951 and um, the official renaming of the um, Anglo-Iranian oil company to British Petroleum in 1953, and how at the moment BP actually owns and takes care of, or is a custodian of all the archives that have been produced in Iran. By archive, I mean documents and contracts and films and photographs, the, the, the archive is massive. So this is one of the outlets that I'm going to talk about um, with the project. The entanglement between authority and visuality within these archives embodies the underlying structure of colonial archives, looking without being seen, a, a, a total uh, system of visualization. So this is um, just a photograph from my, uh, from my field work um, at BP Archive. Um, two summers ago. And I wanted to create this glossary of keywords as I was thinking about uh, the concept of the notion of publicness and uh, colonial archives. And, you know, these are really, um, uh, really big containers, these keywords, you know, when we think about colonial archives and systems of visuality as a way to, to claim the right to look as a way that um, in the case of BP, uh, when it was operating in Iran, the company had um, a, a department completely um, dedicated to documenting um, um, the oil workers, um, private and public life um, and uh, for different propaganda reasons uh, for the company in order for them to advertise um, uh, British government's operations in Iran, um, in Europe um, for um, harnessing um, um, political and economic support. And um, if we think about uh, colonial archives as a way for um, the oil company to, to create legitimacy, for create um, uh, construct their own history, their version of history of um, um, exporting colonial modernity uh, or petro modernity, if you will, um, to Iran at a time. So, you know, um, while I was working with these materials, which has been over four years, um, I uh, really grappled with many 
with many of these concepts like how can I really uh, work with these materials without really taking them as evidence without really thinking uh, taking them as um, um, as um, what was visible and uh, what was um, um, what was uh, true to the life of the oil workers um, going to see if I can go forward. Um, for instance, um, this uh, quote from Anne Stoller, who's, um, in, uh, who's written extensively on colonial archive, in which she says, to distinguish what was unwritten because it could go without saying and everyone knew it, and what was unwritten because it could not be articulated, and was unwritten because it could not be said. So there's a lot of um, uh, different mm, mm, conditions that one needs to be aware when, when we are working with colonial archives to really um, understand the gaps, the contradictions, the absences within, um, uh, within the archival material. Um, without going further, uh, I'm going to play a small clip. It's four minutes long of my film. This one has sound um, and it's in Farsi, but has um, uh, subtitles. And then I will uh, take up um, on, on the talk further. اگر واگذاری حق مالکیت به زمین توسط قرارداد انجام می شود، قراردادی که حق دیده شدن، حق عکاسی شدن و پدیدار شدن در تصویر را منعقد می کند، کجاست؟ قراردادی برای حق به تصویر، تصاویری که به جای دیگر سفر می کنند، در طول پروژه استعماری انگلیس در ایران، فضا و تصویر تبدیل به دو ابزار کنترل شدند. فضا بدن را منضبط می کند و تصویر بینایی را. سینما ها به طور خاص، به یکی از فضاهای اصلی تفریح برای کارگران شهرهای نفت ایران تبدیل شدند و از آنها برای نشان دادن فیلمهای آموزشی و فیلمهای خارجی استفاده می شود. در سال 1325 شرکت نفت 18 سینمای فعال در شهرهای نفتی داشت و تا سال 1326 ساخت 15 سینمای دیگر را در دستور برنامه در کل 16 هزار صندلی سینما توسط شرکت نفت در شهرهای مختلف نفتی جنوب غرب ایران ساخته شدند سینما ابزاری برای توضیح بدنها در فضاه اجتماعی شد مکانی که انبوه مردم دست بندی و سازماندهی می شدند. برنامه اجتماعی شرکت نفت کارگران را به بیننده های تبدیل کرد که اعمال خود را نظارگر می شدند. پرورش دادن چشم برای دیدن زمان کنترل شده. گویی هر جا نفت هست، بیننده، جمعیت و پرده سینما هم وجود دارد. سینما و نفت هر دو مفهومی به ظاهر قابل قبول از زمان را ارائه می دهند. پدیداری خشونت استعماری در ایران، و وابستگیش به عکاسی نقطه آغازینی برای درک رابطه عکاسی و فیلم و نقش آنها به عنوان فناوری قدرت و کنترل است در طول اتصابات کارگری که از دهه 1310 آغاز شد و تا ملیشان صنعت نفت ادامه داشت 
سینماها به مکان مبارزه زد استعماری تبدیل شدند. این عکس در سینما تاج گرفته شده است. یکی از شاخص ترین سینما های کارمندان بالا رتبه شرکت نفت که در اعتراضات فروردی ماه 1330 مورد حمله قرار گرفت و اشغال شد. مبارزه ضد استعماری به پرده سینما کشته شده بود و سینما تبدیل به نماد استعمار در شهرهای نفتی شد. تصویر همگن نفت در هم گسیخته بود. So that was a short clip. Um, the film itself is um, 45 minutes. Um, I'm gonna go to another clip, um, but I'm gonna talk over it. <laughs> um, understanding the power dynamic within colonial archives provides a potent point of departure to understand who one is in relation to the social and public milieu one occupies. and the role of archives as materials of times and the spaces of spectatorship in these exchanges. Archival encounters are posthumous and are bound to be opened up in their forthcoming afterlife. Historian Antoinette Berton, he describes this space of encounter as a contact zone between the past, present and future, wherein systems of symbolic and material power have created, uh, have created an economy of desire. This economy of desire is similar to taming an un uncertain force Understanding one's desire with relation to a nexus between social, political, and personal relations, which situates one in the midst of a designated historical context. At the core of this economy lies an ideological battleground in which the semiotics of gender, race, ethnicity, and labor conditions will have to be completely and critically assessed and opened up. It is important to understand what categories are employed to visualize, narrativize, or represent economic class, gender, or race in these archives. Semiotics authorize articulation and following Frank uh, B. Wilderson, who describes semiotics as a map for, for recognition, those subjects who, uh, who are not articulated uh, by these archives, by semiotic, are automatically and structurally off the map, dislocated. In my film, One Image to Acts, I seek to create a space to negotiate and map this contract and contact zone of these archival encounters. The contact zone of such encounters implicate the symbolic and ideological structures while it evokes the, evokes the relatedness and different material realities embedded within these documents. My project concerns the contradiction and uncertainties which were the conditions of production, production of these archives and seeks to employ, employ them in the process of revival animation. Writing on the question of recovery within archival works, Lisa Lowe draws our attention to the intertwined relationship between critical methods of working with archives and what constitute as evidence. The act of recovery, Lisa Rowe writes, is not a quest to unravel a clear understanding of present condition based on the archival evidence, but rather is actively questioning the conditions of knowledge production, the archaeology of knowledge as the instrument of governance and instigator of invisibility. In this process, I follow the stories, commonalities across different colonial experiences and moments of discontinuities. instances when the document's temporality fall behind or may even fa uh, go faster than the material conditions of which they were a part. For instance, um, what you just saw was the document that I, um, I found in the archive that was one of my main uh, sources to, um, to um, track down the exact number of um, cinema spaces and cinema scenes that were Uh, constructed during oil uh, the oil company's operations in Iran, which was one of the main topics of my film. How am I doing on time? I think my, my alarm still has two minutes to go. 
I'm gonna go faster here. All right, you're good. I'm good, okay. So uh, I'm gonna read again and um, just to go through the slides as fast as I can. Um, the filmic and photographic archives of BP were once a portrayal of, the per of what the precision of petromodernity petro -modernity looked like through the lens of the oil enterprise. The visual materials and acts of seeing associated with them have created a multitude of imaginary spaces which require different acts of reading that should go beyond the territory of factual excavation. In many recent works on colonial archives done by historian, ar historians, artists, anthropologists, the previously fixed evidentiary status of the documents has been contested, reinvented, and countered by different methods and mediums. Accumulating these contested facts and unseen archives should enter the realm of narration and following uh, Anjali Arundekar suggests we should read archival evidence against a fiction of access, not just because what we see, it means that it was true and actually was portrayed and represented according to the will of the people who were who represent, represented. So it's really important for me to really think about both the material and the psych psychic residues of these colonial archives and how they're manifested um, um, in, in, the, in, um, in the public space. In my project, I asked, how can these documents become a tool for identifying with the post-colonial present by, by contesting the colonial experience itself? Who possessed the authority to, system, to systematize an archive? And on the other side, who is documented? How do colonial documents strategize visual information and disseminate knowledge? I return to these visual materials as fragments of an archive whose traces should not remain as legitimate, legitimate documentation. However, we should see them as interventions and aspirations for a collective project. All right, I think I'm just gonna maybe end here. <laughs> I don't wanna go too much over time. Um, and I was um, almost at the end of my presentation. There's just one line <laughs> that I want to end with is that uh, a project of tracing the material conditions of post-coloniality within these sets of archives and um, destabilizing BP archives should be something that really questions the archive itself. It, it's something that constantly tries to counter the materials that are within the BP archive through all our oral history, which I, which I did in my film, through co collecting um, counter archives, through, through doing interviews by former oil workers and collecting um, um, a, a parallel set of um, archive um, that, um, that counter the sort of the totalizing and homogenous narrative that was um, uh, represented um, and uh, utilized by BP. And um, yeah, I will just um, leave it at here. Thank you. Thank you, Sanaz. Okay, uh, Abe. Hey, yes. All right. Um, hi, how's everyone doing? Um, my name is Abe Adelami and um, Mark has given you a bit of my bio, but before continuing with my work, um, just kind of maybe elaborate on that a bit. Um, but before even doing that, I wanted to thank everyone for coming today. And um, it's really great to be on the panel with uh, Sanaz and Tricia. Um, I've known both of their work for many years in Chicago. Um, and um, uh, I'm looking forward to the Q&A section and the discussion section of the, of the panel as well. Um, so a bit more uh, about my work. Um, my work really focuses on the urban space uh, and the urban framework itself in addressing how that should be thought of um, in a postmodernist sense uh, in terms of looking at the relationship um, urban and built environments have with capitalism, um, structures of um, consumption, um, and also how they um, start to create these structures and nodes that are um, networked globally. 
Um, so, for, but from cities, one of the things that I've always been particularly interested in how information and knowledge travels within an urban framework. And I've been particularly also interested in um, oral traditions as a component of that. And also um, thinking of how digital technology has come to influence um, um, oral traditions and what they've evolved into. So, so, and how all oral traditions have evolved over time. Um, so, oral traditions and especially um, oral histories um, are are these ancient practices that have evolved, how they've filtered through the digital age in its public implications today. So thinking of such um, apparatuses that are now producing knowledge, um, such as YouTube and ways of engaging with public figures, um, such as Twitter um, and various other social media outlets. Um, so my talk today is um, largely about this research methodology that's um, abstractly found within my work. And, but through that research uh, methodology, I want to present two projects that really draw from it. Um, and those projects um, are, Field are Field Station 5, which is a podcast series. Um, that seeks to interview um, scholars in relationship with um, everyday citizens, artists, and activists um, that are tied to a physical location and the experiences and um, sort of trials and tribulations of that physical location. And the second is a digital project called uh, Mixtape Exchange, which is a project that seeks that seeks to give its users the ability to curate sounds and audio um, files that are so, um, specifically based and tied to a location that they are in. So, um, and cu curate this and present this in the form of a mixtape um, that would um, reveal the narrative of any given space. Um, so, um, here. So in terms of thinking of um, oral tradition, the significance um, of an event that used to be archived orally and passed on from one member of a group to another has not entirely vanished as I mentioned. Um, and today and today and events and its events is mimicked by digital representation and things like um, podcasts and um, and playlists as well. And within the digital social media sphere, the legitimacy of these forms of curated forms of knowledge are often based on how people share them, how people use them. Um, and um, that usability, the greater the usability, the more legitimacy um, such um, projects or audio files would gain. So one of the ways of I'm looking and tackling this idea is through um, the podcast project, um, Field Station 5. And Field Station 5 uh, essentially is a project, as I mentioned, which explores um, geospatial politics um, that is centered around um, the human center, that's around the human center era called the Anthropocene. And the first iteration of this took place in 2019 in um, the Mississippi Delta. Um, the project was to look at the inhabitants of the Mississippi Delta through the concept of both uh, concepts of land and the aquatic and their relationship with this over time. Um, so looking at the geographical area this project was looking at was between um, Memphis, Tennessee and um, New Orleans, um, Louisiana. So in this project, there was a collection of stories and interviews with scholars that were working on subject matters that specific, specifically um, 
that's specifically focused on the region um, with artists and activist groups also living in, within the region to sort of create and tell, uh, create this narrative of what the Mississippi Delta would be. Um, one of the things that really struck out or two things that struck out within the project and how it began to evolve were, um, so one was the, um, specifically the relationship or the, the way this region um, mimicked sections of West Africa uh, in terms of um, geography, um, climate, but also specifically within the um, Louisiana basin, um, the relationship both of these regions had with petrochemical um, corporations. Um, and one of the things the projects ended up focusing naturally focusing on being shaped by the stories collected um, was the environmental degradation within the area. So um, a great deal of the land is also eroding, which is um, cre um, creating forced migration due to climate. Um, there are privatization of water wells, which um, leaves certain um, populations um, insecure with water. And um, due to also the chemicals released within the, uh, in the atmosphere in the region, there's a high risk of birth defects and cancers. And specifically within a section of Louisiana known as Cancer Alley. And to collect stories and um, archive them, but also begin to evolve them and think of how they can um, connect to similar regions, um, particularly in West Africa. I really started to think of one of the things that um, a great deal of the, um, the stories really wove in together was the forced displacement and uh, migration um, and forced migration within the, the region, which is also a similar condition happening within the Niger Delta region as well. So. The second iteration of the project um, evolved into telling the story of migration and specifically climate induced migration. Um, and the field station then be, um, was stationed in Berlin, Germany for the past year in a continued research um, space um, in collaboration with um, an organization here, a cultural organization here in Berlin, um, Haus der Kulturen der Welt. And through this collaboration, we sort of developed a second series of the um, podcast, which told the story of migration and how specifically um, migration policies being developed and um, how um, 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 different accords and climate initiatives and also the EU and the UN are looking to address and understand um, climate induced migration from the African continent um, with a U, uh, with a World Bank prediction that within the next 30 years um, between 150 to 200 million people will be displaced um, on the African continent and um, and therefore and and due to that, there, um, you know, increasingly became more important to um, think of a migration policy that would address this situation as where, whereas none currently exists. Um, so the project um, weaved in again stories of migrants um, to Europe and to Germany specifically, but then also um, interviews and conversations with um, climate experts, migration researchers, um, um, and um, climate policy advisors as well. And this is just kind of a stat of how the project um, focused its, its point on thinking about migration from Africa to Europe. And the third phase of the project will be occurring later this year, where the field station finally makes its way to the Niger Delta region to then focus on um, the relationship the region has had with the um, various petrochemical 
corporations. Um, and as it stands currently, the, Del the Niger Delta um, has been so altered by, um, um, by the various oil spills that the ecosystem would not be able to self-correct if oil production stops today, would not be able to self-correct um, for the next three to 500 years. So, and these were the episodes. And um, so from that, I really, I'm, I'm I, in conjunction with that project, I'm further developing um, the Mixtape Exchange Project, which really focuses on um, how knowledge and how conversations and interviews occur, um, particularly how those conversations um, are so specifically tied to a location. And um, within these conversations, you can actually develop and build a narrative um, that illustrates um, the identity of a place. And, you know, when one thing that I found quite um, charming about the concept of a mixtape for this, I really felt, I really feel that the, um, the mixtape as a um, archival concept um, also is a um, simultaneously a curatorial um, project as well. You know, um, in, in one sense that it archives interviews because their beliefs, uh, because it, it gives, um, it build, builds um, a lasting value in the interview, in the interviews by um, having those interviews or even conversations um, shared, but also amplified within a specific community. Um, you know, the concept of mixtape explores the notion um, of a method, instruments and means by which our experiences and imagination of planetary change might be noted and traced and measured and registered. Um, I, I, I see the, I further see the mixtape as it, it provides um, a soundtrack to a moment, um, however big or small. Um, it, the mixtape, um, I see it as um, essentially um, what, what one would consider a play, the evolution of a playlist or you know, your RSS feed today in which um, a series of audio files or new short news clips are curated together um, based on subject matters um, or um, things that you might be particularly interested in. Whereas this project seeks to have users sort of record sounds within their environment um, and um, create uh, and curate uh, um, these sounds into a narrative of some sort and then geotag it with a specific neighborhood or um, a specific city or section of a city. And um, as these tapes are collected, the goal is there are a series of narratives that would represent any given space. So. And that is essentially, yeah. Thank you, Abe. Thank you. All right, now we have Trisha Vanek. Who's sharing now? So thank you everyone um, for sharing your time, um, attention. I'm just gonna try to, am I unmuted? You're all good, ready to go. Oh, okay, I'm just trying to get my slide. Um, there we go. Right. Um, thank you everyone for sharing your time. Like I said, your attention, I, like Sanaz said, it's everybody zooming. Um, and thank you, Mark and Brandon and Kate for inviting me. 
I'm also thrilled to present with my amazing colleagues and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. So please keep me on track. If I too go over, I'm gonna start. Um, so my, the other speakers, my colleagues, are, uh, presentations are very global and I'm gonna be very local, <laughs> um, but our discussions have to do with power and how do individuals in public have control over their lives and their identity, their archive, their history. And um, I start with this, our performative event, uh, Cows on Parade on the Rhinestone Cowboy on the 606, which is what we may think of as public space. And I'm gonna be talking probably more so about public space, space the spatial, uh, what is private space, what is public space. And Rhinestone Cowboy um, delved into the history of Chicago's dairy trade, um, but it was really a celebration of the transformational event of the equinox, something that we all, all across the world share. Um, and it was the making of seasons, with the change of seasons. Um, but do we think of, so that's, that's very public, 606 is our newest public space. Um, but do we think of homes as public space? So 6018 North is on Kenmore, this is it. It's the address of the space I run. Uh, it's a dilapidated mansion, it may not look so dilapidated, but it's on a residential street. It was built in 1910 as a private home. Um, but the house, was, the house was collectively saved in 20s, in 27, yeah, uh, by the community. And um, it's located in a very diverse street, uh, the Kenmore Winthrop Corridor. Um, Chicago is very segregated and, um, but Edgewater and this particular area is where people of all ages, um, sexual orientation, income, races, including refugees um, from all over the world can meet outside as in this slide. Um, home, uh, home public or private was our first show. Home um, is literally the intersection between public and private. As soon as you, you can be inside in certainly with um, uh, Facebook and Instagram, you can be very public in your private home, but literally when you walk out at that threshold, you are then in public space. And it's also the intersection between generosity and self-interest and the individual and the collective, all ideas that um, 6018 is really engaged with. Um, but because a home reads as private, how do you create a public space? How do you create public dialogue? Uh, people enter, public spaces like stores really easily, but um, not homes, because there's you know a barrier. You don't necessarily walk into someone's home. There's stand to ground <laughs> laws, there's craziness. Um, so we have to encourage people to engage. So this first piece, we had this uh, red carpet where we asked, um, and I think Katrina's here, she was part of this, um, for the show, um, we asked people to pose for the red carpet and we had a microphone and a microphone brings individual voice into the public sphere. But we're questioning how do individuals gain public voice and whose voices are heard and where? Are voices in poor neighborhoods like this heard as noise or are they heard as speech? And so, we try to bring, um, we try to eliminate that barrier um, to bring art to the public so that they can just, you know, see it at the gate or enter the gate to, in this case, literally explore the ground beneath us or um, to use this, what again might be considered private space as a playground. And, um, and here taking over the street to, to really make the street public, to change the street into a community gathering space. So that um, this one long table is essentially a block party, famous in Chicago, um, where we you know, encourage our neighbors who are literally from all over the world to bring food from all over the world. And the parents come because um, the bouncy house is there. And so then they, <laughs> they have to come because their kids are you know, in the bouncy house. 
And um, we also, also like to include neighbors um, or we like to ask artists if they will include neighbors in helping to make the art as seen here and um, here. It's also important that it then move to public space so that it's not just an exercise, but actually it's really how art is made uh, or can be made if artists and the public are willing. Um, and here inside the house that then becomes part of this piece. Um, but um, how to be public now? Um, during this pandemic and the ensuing racial, economic, economic and ideological challenges, um, we, um, tried, we created a street facing show, um, working with curators, and here's it at night, curators, artists, and neighbors as to create kind of a collective public to ask this question. Um, how do we want to see the world when we get out? A year, it's almost a year later. Well, uh, not 10 months later. Um, how do we rethink these problems and solutions and find solutions and to these challenges? And so um, we made work so that you could again see it from outside on the street, but in, in close up, but also in ads um, in New City that could reach across Chicago to, um, to really um, ask questions and, and what can we really do as a collective to create the change we wanna see. Um, so much of our work has to do with um, barriers, um, challenging perceptions. So how do we you know, break down and cross these barriers? So this you see is um, the door that's part of the Justice Hotel. And it is, um, so one great barrier is um, fear and uh, why I enter the house? How do we enter? It's also knowledge. So we're not, um, everybody's on mute, so I can't ask you how you get in. And I don't have a slide to show you, but um, the, I'll just say that the knobs are a distraction. The, and, and this is a part of, this, of the, these barriers. Now, um, the system can also often create um, distractions, maybe, maybe not purposeful, but they become distractions or really tough for people to navigate. And people who know the system, literally this system is just pushing the door, it has nothing to do with the knobs. It's easy um, to, to navigate if you know the system. Um, and so um, one of the things that um, we do is um, try, like I said, to break down these barriers. And the number one fear is public speaking. And this was a piece that, um, a show that Sanaz was in as well, literally next door to this. And she was laying under rocks. <laughs> um, so that's another fear that you might not want to get killed by a boulder. But um, this one is public speaking. Um, so to participate, in this piece, you have to walk into the room and stand in the center of everyone staring at you. And this was this little girl was literally the first person to break that fourth, fourth wall. And other pieces are in the show were less interactive, but no less intimidating and, you know, challenge the distinctions between what is private space, my intimate body versus um, public space. Um, and so much of this work is easier with food. Um, we always have food at our events. Food is transformational. It's uh, often ritualistic. It's something that everyone understands. Everyone knows they need to eat, um, they can share in. And so, um, and we have um, food on our porch at events inside the house. Um, and when you enter someone's home, it's a site of hospitality, generosity, you know, food and drink encourages people to stay. Uh, too much wine and people stay really late. Um, but we can also discuss things. It, it, 
it, it is this kind of um, way of um, uh, opening up the set, opening up the mind through opening up the senses. And um, we also, uh, we have a lot of conversational dinners. The Justice Hotel had many community, every, every night was a community dinner. Um, but we also try to have these um, food and intimate encounters in public space, not just um, at 6018 North. Because out, I, when I say public space, I mean literally outside of 6018 North. And because not, we recognize not everyone can get to the North side, nor should they, um, and that we need to often go out. And so here, Carlos is um, literally inviting people to mix the arepas. Um, in, in a very intimate space in his, um, in his pocket that he created. And then, and then asking people if they would eat with him and share this. Um, and here then again, this is a representation of um, the previous piece um, done then in a larger public sphere at, um, at Expo. Um, and to get to the show, which was upstairs, you had to walk by these people. So there's no way you could avoid, um, you had to have this kind of public encounter. And so um, again, how do we have this public encounter during COVID? And we did have this windows to the world, which was the show outside, but, um, part of windows to the world was we had exterior events since people could go outside. And I'm just going to show this. Um, maybe I'll just talk about it a little bit before playing it. But for our water music on the rocks, we had this New Orleans funereal procession. Um, which honored people, which honored people in a way that, in, in, honored the dead in a way that people have been unable to do. Like in New Orleans, we filled the streets with music. space needs to be filled with people. And so the Justice Hotel was an experiment in um, cooperative, um, in, it, we're also always challenging capitalism and, and economics. And could we um, make money from the house to rent rooms and we would provide people with uh, who stayed with dinners, the conversational dinners and events. And, um, and it would be shared by all of the people who participated in, um, in the creation of the dinners, the curators and the artists. And um, so, yes, this was um, very public, but also you're, it's very private in your own room. And let's see, I end um, with this project of a liminal house on Ohio Street Beach. Um, the footprint um, is of a house, uh, a Midwestern typical house. Um, and it's on the edge where the water, it's at Ohio Street Beach. It's on the edge where the water meets the land. And it's also, um, and, and it's also on, the, on the space where um, private meets the public because 
along as you, I don't know if you could see, but it's all along the strip of Lakeshore Drive high rises. So anyone in this home, um, which seems very private when you're in it, um, can be seen by anyone, literally, um, you know, thousands and thousands of people from high rises. So I'll stop sharing, right? If I can. Thank you. Thank you all. Those were great presentations. I really enjoyed uh, all the work involved. Um, I just wanted to um, kind of, I think, I think I want to start with, uh, my, I think my first question for the whole panel is, uh, is something that, um, that uh, Trisha had said, which kind of like struck a chord with me is uh, the, the, the question that you raised, Trisha, is uh, when, when is a voice noise and when is it speech? Um, and I was just um, kind of, you know, I was thinking about uh, Abe's work around uh, oral histories and how that's contested, right, within the West, like Western framing of like what of like what sort of history, what constitutes history, um, and how um, there are also uh, like l l looking at uh, archives in Sana's work about like how. Uh, uh, who actually like uh, allows uh, the, the objects to be collected uh, within an archive? Who gets to be represented? Uh, and so there's also that also that kind of tension of like when is uh, a, a voice becomes noise or even kind of not necessarily represented in a way. So I was wondering if. Um, uh, you could all kind of, I don't know, talk a little bit more about like how, uh, how these like, how we can look like we can contest like public spaces and allow for or allow, allow for more like marginal voices to, to uh, be elevated uh, within these kind of if, if we were to kind of rethink what public space is. It's for all of us. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to ref um reformulize the, the question. It's um, rethinking what these, what public space can be, how, how it, public space can be more egalitarian, correct? Right, right. And to kind of shift that dynamic from, mm -hmm. or, shift the, that, that, or make that shift uh, from uh, voice being noise to actual speech, right? Like how, uh, how could like more marginal voices be represented like, in these like uh, new ways of looking at public spaces? I can, ad I can address um, like the, I, I think the word barbarian came from this idea of um, that the, the sound the people that the Greeks thought the sound that foreigners made was bar, bar, bar. And um, I think that this um, us versus them, how do you break down this in group, out group? And that's what we're always, we are lucky at 6018 that every group lives on our block. So how can we bring them together? And that's a luxury that we have. Uh, and so it's still a challenge to listen, for everyone to listen and 
and hear each other. I think outside of our space, it's how do they even get on this in the in the same room or the same platform? How do you who's even listening? Uh, like like what you asked about Sanaz, who's caring for the archive of the people that the archive doesn't want to hear from? Um, yeah, so I can I can follow up on that. Um, I think um, for um, my project and thus far, what I've tried to what I've tried to sort of do to supplement and contest um, also um, the, the archives that I've been working with is to first look at the the, the archive itself as a as an infrastructure as something that was. Um, it was very systematic. It was, um, we're, we're talking about over 50 years of oil operations that they were really um, strategically utilizing visual and media um, structures such as cinema, movie production, photography, uh, print publication, all of these things to European festivals to really create an image of petrol modernity of British um, operations in Iran uh, and Iraq and Kuwait also, by the way. BP, as you know it today, was a very basic an economic monopoly of the British government in Iran, Kuwait and Iraq for, for many years. Um, so for me to really um, work within these archives, I knew that I had to really find a way to um, to um, find a find a window for myself because uh, for a long time the archive had the upper hand over me. It took me um, like three years for me to actually to find my way around really finding finding the voice because. Um, it's funny you to say voice when you go and look at these photographs and these albums, um, you know, everything is it's, it's only you and these huge albums and the dust and um, and um, and uh, there's no there's no sound involved. And one thing that I was working with my sound designer for the film was that I was really uh, for a long time we we're talking about like how can we work with the sound design in a way that really brings this sort of like the violence of these images because what we see is very uh, it's very um, disruptive it's very it's very um it's very violent how can we speak to that violence through creation of this sound and through sound design and really connecting that and on the other hand um i supplemented the bp archives particularly with the um with the film arc uh, film archives um of the um, um, of uh, Iranian new wave cinema, that was um, it's a it's it's kind of like a long thing to go through. But I supplemented that um, the films and photographs of BP uh, with another sort of like um, 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 anti-colonial cinematic movement that was um, that became really. Um, 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 present in Iran between 50s until the end of 70s. So for me, I read the BP archive against the grain of um, this uh, Iran's new wave cinema and how the filmmakers um, 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 the, through their cinematic language and the film culture really um, were directly criticizing the, fil uh, the, the oil industry and sort of um, um, it's um, it's um, um, unequalizing uh, presence um, in, in the society. So I hope it wasn't too long. <laughs> Are you on mute? You're mute. <laughs> Pardon me, sorry. No, I was just saying to follow up on that. Um, I believe uh, my mixtape exchange project is um, probably more similar to um, Trisha's work in the sense where um, I think um, what the museum also stands for is um, this collective voice of the community um, as participants, as viewers, and also creators within it. And what, and that's also specifically what the Mixtape Exchange Project is seeking, is to um, collectively archive um, the voice and the curated um, memories and sentiments of um, people within a neighborhood or a community. Um, and, and so then what it does as it presents all of this archives to the public is um, it presents um, all of those voices um, on equal footing as being the legitimate voices that 
um, one individually doesn't function as a voice for the community, but they all s collectively have to work in tandem to represent this community and give um, um, give a um, legitimacy to and present its, its identity through the various sentiments within it. I was, um, and, and if you actually have uh, questions for yourselves, that would be uh, great to hear too. Uh, but I, you know, I, uh, I, I, I wanted to ask, ask a question that's uh, very uh, Cape specific um, in that uh, like we, uh, we're an organization that works with a lot of teachers uh, and artists in, in the classroom and Abe and Sanas, you're, you've, you've done some of the work before I was, uh, I was like wondering, like, how has like, uh, how could some of your projects uh, could, um, could like augment some of like certain teaching practices that kind of like, that, that actually has to deal with like learning, uh, like historical materials. Uh, and, um, and, uh, uh, um, uh, things about uh, geography and how might some of those projects allow for other uh, entry points for, for students and even educators and artists to start kind of uh, tying all these um, other uh, things that, that are part of economic systems to kind of enter into these conversations kind of allow for like a more well a more, a more rounded uh kind of uh idea of like of of things that have happened like in uh within history and then within within spaces you can go okay right after you yeah uh, you know i think um you know, for me, I think one of the reasons I'm interested with um, in the um, the interview format is, um, particularly also how that interview format is structured. Um, that you know, we together is this podcast series, Field Station Five, um, and is because of one the reach of podcasts um, and how they are they can be locally focused while simultaneously being able to reach a wide um, audience. And um, within the design of this podcast, it's a mixture of conversations with people that are um, integral to a specific location and specific space. Um, but then also weaved into that um, are interviews with scholars that are working on um, specific matters that also is um, is attached to this space as well. So um, it offers a uh, an array and um, a, yeah, sort of a spectrum of entry points um, into um, a way to engage with the with the topic that I think it's very important. How many full, uh, How many podcasts are there is so far? Like where um, so far, we, I've, I've done two seasons, um, and each one consists of five episodes. Um, and yeah, these podcasts can be found um, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and it's Field Station Five. All right, thank you. That's awesome. And do you plan to um, like have a third season and? Like how is the production going on? Yeah, the third season is, um, I'm hoping, I mean, it's planned to be later this year um, in the Niger Delta region. Um, and, you know, the, so what the, the larger design of the whole project starting in the Mississippi Delta um, and then moving to Europe to focus on um, climate induced migration um, and then um, within the Niger Delta to focus on migration and um, the degradation of petrochemical companies within the region. Um, I'm hoping to circle back to start to 
um, engage with a lot of the activist organizations that I've worked with um, to make a fourth season that's about, that focuses on um, the various solidarity efforts mm -hmm. that many organizations are taking up and how these um, solidarity efforts um, communicate or engage with one another on a global scale to support local initiatives. That's awesome. We have to talk about oil at some point. <laughs> yes. yeah. I, think yeah. contemporary. I have a lot of historical, um, like my, I'm more historical looking at like um, a lot of uh, films and archives from the decolonization, um, formation of OPEC, um, you know, and um, I have some archives from Nigeria as well, but primary, like all my archives are from OPEC members. Um, mm -hmm. um, and um, so Nigeria is included, but um, primarily I'm focusing on um, Western Asia. But um, yeah, it's interesting. I think like, you're looking at sort of like the, the aftermath, I'm sort of like looking at the beginnings and sort of like the middle grounds of like how these like oil companies sort of like, you know, work through their resource colonies and then sort of like how, how that sort of like, you know, through um, what was the faith of nationalizations and decolonization and sort of the hopes and the failures. And, and uh, by the same time, you know, the criticism of like I think the the, the colonial era company towns like ha is reaches a form of like a passe at some point you can't do that because like there's so many forms of like south to south like violent um, forms of like disenfranchisement and um, colonization that is just um, makes the equation really um, at the moment really challenging to really try to unpack you know to unpack all these units to to see and to understand like the historical footprints that we are sort of like getting as um, the legacy. So um, I'm really interested um, um, on uh, the case of Nigeria also because um, in terms of the oil company and the way the, the legal system works and the, the legal um, cases around it, I think is super unique and compared to the case of Iran, for instance, and like, um, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, I really would love to talk to you more about um, your research and, um, you know, also BP and Shell are one of the uh, two of the, lar of the largest um, petrochemical companies in Nigeria as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting to, to sort of talk about the um, the consequences of these colonial projects. Um, but I, I think, you know, one of the, I mean, I, I believe you also highlighted this in the sense that they're not essentially past projects, but are, have continued um, and, you know, just evolved into different structures and formations, but it's been the same project. And um, when it comes to things like climate change and the global effects of that, we're looking at the consequences of these decisions made uh, a century ago. Yeah. I think Trisha has something to say. Yeah, um, well, I'm also hugely interested <laughs> in like sustainability. And so I could go down that whole like soil, oil, because all these companies are actually investing in like the land of Africa too. So, um, but, um, I'm going to share just this this image um, because when um, you were talking about equal footing and solidarity, I I kind of you know there's so much nuance with any show that I could have gone on forever, but um, mm -hmm. the outside. So this show was um, a show solely of immigrants, and so the neighborhood is immigrants and so the outside and inside the the mirroring or the connecting with um, those who are outside as well as those who are inside are the same and I would um that kind of um and I and I um uh, let's see I'm not going to try to figure out how to share again <laughs> how to make it big but um this this kind of what is what we really found I personally loved and it worked really well is um to have uh, artists 
actually engage the students in a real project that they are working on. It's, it's difficult to do, but it's not like, it's not extremely difficult. So this became those, um, those uh, that this refers, this is bubble wrap and it deals with not all immigrants. There are a range of experience, experiences and those who arrive with things wrapped up in bubble wrap are never criticized as the caravan is. Um, and so these kids, you can see they dotted the, the bubble wrap. So they didn't make the whole piece, but they you know, would come every week to work on it. So could, um, and also, so the, the house was, I don't know if I also told you that the history of the house, it was based on the house too. The history was built, the house was built in 1910 by immigrants for an immigrant and for an immigrant who really supported union labor. So we also had work that was dealing with what it means to be, to think about labor. I mean, it was all about labor. We opened up on Labor Day and what is it to have union labor? So. And what happens if you stop paying attention to the role of unions? Uh, they, it slips away and then you lose power and which is happening. And so I don't think history necessarily, at least in this show, history didn't need to be far away. It was actually, you know, that's the show was actually called Living Architecture because the architect who was an immigrant wrote a book called Living Architecture about public, the usage of public spaces and the, and the architecture of public spaces and how it's a living architecture as opposed to kind of a, um, I don't know what, what wouldn't be a living architecture. But I think um, to answer that question, to, to instead of, I mean, I was a teacher and I know there's this need to devise projects, but can you, take your own project and figure out ways that the students or invite an artist who has a project that, that is, you know, multivalent or needs a lot of work mm -hmm. um, and various parts. Can the students um, be involved in some aspect of that? So I'll stop sharing. Oh, that's great. I think related to that too, and, and going back to your projects, um, is that uh, there's there's such a tension to to sight, even like sight as a as as a space uh, to kind of understand your relation to it and how you project outwards. Um, and I'm I'm curious is that uh, your uh, your work before COVID <laughs> was that it was very much about sight as like the archive or uh, the geography connected uh, uh, to uh, land and water uh, and the economy that surrounds it, um, and the site as uh, as as a house and how it's uh, a lot of the the programming connects to the community. Um, and now we're in these um, these I guess um, virtual spaces. Have you noticed that the attention to site has shifted as well? Do you find that there's kind of more intensity of like understanding more about how we're connected to site and how we articulate from uh, that specific site? Uh, have you noticed that in, in your own kind of work and the, this, uh, the transition to uh, more uh, live streaming uh, communication or, or, or like classroom settings? I guess I'll go, our, our show at the Cultural Center closed. So then we had no site. <laughs> so then we went online for the active, for the public activities, but we couldn't, you know, people couldn't. So we did tours. But then with the, with the Windows to the World show, I started doing, we started, I started doing um, studio visits with Courtney Letterer. And um, I started telling artists that they should do their work in their window because everyone has windows. So 
share your work with the public through windows and then i thought we've got all these windows so that so it's still sight and people really walk by in our neighborhood um so it's i mean i'm i'm kind of something's changed and obviously and then some things didn't for us and neighbors still um you know respond to the work Oh, Sanas, were you going to say something? No, I just, I wanted to read, I, there's another question. I was just reading it. Um, okay, I'm going to read the question loud. Maybe it's nicer for everyone. All of your work deals with just, just blah, I'm sorry, deals with juxtaposition of realities, which offer an insight into both the immediate local as well as larger city, regional, national, and globally unrecognized geographically and socially ignorant realities of histories is one of your goals to complete and um, uh, augment histories through audio and visual and performance arts to promote greater cultural understanding and an expansion of cultural awareness and the impact of those local realities exploded to the larger impact of the planet and the consequences of the now. Are you also challenging the, those who realize the mosaic of these realities into the, into, um, Taught, taught leaders who help to develop more equitable human strategies going forward? It's a big question. <laughs> I would hope so. Uh, how do you know? Yeah, I mean, for it, so for me, uh, I can just go. I, I can chip in a little bit on the, on the question. So, um, I um, so I knew about um, um, the, the the history of BP, of course, but I was not aware of the extent of the BP archive. They're 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 expansive and also they're really vital um, around the question around the question of ownership. To these archives and these films and photographs and documents and contracts and i had a, quite a hard time to get access to them i know um, they're open to the public but it takes a you, know, you need to get permission and whatnot and to to visit them they're they're very paranoid about it the bp in particular they're really really paranoid um, especially if you're iranian working on it on the archive especially last um uh, summer two summers ago um a film came out, uh, Coup 53, that sort of like exposed the role of uh, MI6 directly in the in the um, um, 1953 coup in Iran. So they really are um, um, very sensitive about the topic. So for me, it was really important to really um, not only work with the BP archive, but also really work on um, gathering um, really valuable and important historical archives that have been really um, just invisible, like the archives of OPEC, the, the, are the transnational networks of solidarity among oil producing countries that was really prevalent in 50s, 60s, and 70s, really looking at the ways in which that these um, countries try to um, 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 look at their um, um, industries um, and raw material um, industries as a sort of like prism of nationalization, like resource nationalization was really huge at back then. So, yeah, for me it was um, at the moment, I think it's really important to really, um, um, you know, hold people accountable for many of the sort of like historical responsibilities that they've had. Uh, you know, there's a lot of legal issues that have remain, remained um, untouched and undiscussed. So I think climate justice um, is, um, is something that uh, is all about this sort of, um, enduring legacies of colonial modernity that many of these resource colonies have endured and continue to endure for years to come. So for BP right now to, uh, they've changed actually their name from British Petroleum to Beyond Petroleum actually, if you, it's all about future right now. So it's all about future oriented sort of like green, te green technology, right? Um, so at this point, I think, especially thinking about these archives is way more unimportant than ever because they really try to push everything back into like a closed episode and then move forward, become beyond petroleum, right? So I think right now it's actually really, really important to really think about these petrocultures, the archives, and 
try to um, uh, try to to create the spaces for, for discussion for uh, for um, really creating other sets of narratives that have been um, uh, long missing and um, yeah. I think I mean I think that's some of that um, end component definitely relates to um, my mixtape exchange project was because it's seeking to try to create these spaces of discussion, um, but also trying to focus and amplify um, often marginalized voices that um, don't get to participate in this archive and don't get to um, have their um, lived experiences um, legitimized. I just want to um, go back to Sana's and her response. And it's a question from uh, Patrice Cantarelli. Uh, the permission process must have been very long and difficult, Sana. Is how do you work through that bureaucracy? Yeah. So, um, so the the first bureaucracy for me was to get the UK visa, which <laughs> took it took a while. The second bureaucracy was um, in, I was in touch with the BP um, archivist. Um, well, it was interesting for for over a year before getting there. One of them was um, she was super nice. She had been with with the archive for years, and she was an archivist. She was like genuinely interested in the archive. She was really caring and really careful with like. With, her, with with the material and she knew everyone who's been working on the material, like artists, filmmakers, scholars, yeah. literature on BP archive. Um, and it's a major resource. Um, um, and, uh, but there was another um, person who was the head of the archive and he was actually someone who was a bureaucrat. He had worked for BP for years and working at the archive was his retirement plan. Like he just wanted to like chill out, be in the archive, you know, just like, not be on the platform, you know, just like, it was like, you know, and he wasn't, I was really <laughs> um, careful around him. Like I really toned down my proposal when I was like, um, hand, like discussing it with them, you know, like I feel like I had to be like a strategic about it, like what I'm sharing and, you know, but I really don't think that they would, I don't, I don't know. I don't think they would have like stopped giving stuff, you know, I, I but I took some precautions, you know, um, but at some point they stopped communicating with me. I think it was, um, um, it's easier if you're there in person, I think, um, over, like I had to call many times. Um, so it was, it was, it was, it was, it was tough to, to get the permissions. But at the same time, I had to, um, I had to be careful how I'm sort of like presenting the work and um, because you want to keep your relationship. You don't want to go on like, like you don't want to like yeah I, I because I want to continue work with, working with them that's my field project and so I definitely have no intention of like creating bad blood <laughs> but um yeah um I'm going to try to bring like two comments together uh one from Scott one from Jamie um are you also challenging those who, oh, oops, no, sorry, sorry, that's a, um, what pedagogical possibilities or questions going forward do you see coming from your work pushing at tensions of public and private spaces? Um, and then I think, yeah, how about if, uh, we just start with that one. The question of pedagogy, you mean? Mm -hmm. um, I read it again. No, I, I, I read the question. Um, thank you. Um, I when I was uh, at Cape, um, I did a lot of work with with the kids with um, digital media because that was my specialty. So I did a lot of photo and sort of um, collage with the kids. I really I think um, um, I, my method um, 
uh, of working with collage and really um, having the kids to um, bring their own personal objects and um, like family archives about their family photographs and then we photographed them, printed them and then work with them throughout the semester, uh, throughout the, the course of the, the project. So um, that was my approach um, because I think every, um, as you can see, everyone is so acquainted with, with their specific medium and the way they deal with this material, right? Uh, Trisha and Abe, they all have like, um, I think we all really um, familiar with a way to deal with a site, deal with the material, whether it's sound, whether it's site, um, archive. So for me, it was um, my, my methodological way of dealing um, with it, uh, with the public and the private was asking the kids to bring their, their personal objects and photographs and then re-photographing them, talking about them. They, they, they presented their objects and and was really really um, a beautiful um, day that we had. So I tried to incorporate that family archives. That was one of our main assignments in the beginning, and then we used that as sort of like a, a starting um, ground for our larger project. I have a question for Abe. Is uh, are you working in private space in the um, with the Mississippi Delta and the and, and when you're working in the land that those projects is that like people's own private space or is that public space or is it commons? Um, th thanks, uh, Tricia. It's a, it's a mixture of um, spaces. It's um, with individuals and their narr narration of their experience within that um, location or space, um, or with organizations, artists, and um, um, and activist groups that are working on specific projects that relate to um, the theme the podcast is um, discussing at the moment. Okay, so it's not specific to public space, but just one being in the world in those specific regions and their experience of it. Yeah, yeah. So it's more, it's, it's rather than um, just a specific focus on public space, it's, it's a focus on um, region and, um, the, and how to, to build an identity that illustrates that region. So it's kind of like building up kind of a creative commons of a creative commons archive or narrative or mixtape. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. It's really cool. I, I kind of have a similar question for you, Tricia. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, I think a lot of people, I, I myself am familiar with a lot of the uh, uh, exhibitions and uh, uh, activities that are at, that are happening 68 to North, um, and there's such an attention to um, having uh, interactions with with the public and the community. I was wondering, are, are there are, are were there projects that were uh, about uh, uh, creating something uh, like an art? an art project or a, uh, an art uh, installation or an event with the community? Has that kind of happened uh, at the space? Well, um, I could answer it in a couple ways. So one of, so that risky encounters that Sanaz was in where the, um, where um, Mikhail Samama was in the locker nude whistling for four hours. Um, one, to get in, you had to, um, you had to pay 20, we were all, like I said, we're interested in, in economy and capitalism. And so um, there is this theory that if you get, if you pay, if you don't pay for something, if you get it for free, you actually criticize it more. And that if you pay for it, you don't, I don't, I do not understand this, but it's proven by um, research of like museums and 
and entry fees. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, we'll try to figure this out. So to get into Risky Encounters, you ha either had to pay $20 or you could forego that, but you had to agree to sign a contract that you would meet someone there and um, do a favor for them or do something for them. So that you had to make this like exchange. And so it forced people to go around and of course, there were some people who are like, I'm not paying this. I mean, I'm not doing that. I'm paying my $20. Um, so that was one that's like an amorphous thing. Um, we did this large scale project that I didn't mention, that I didn't show us slides. It was um, in Would We Trust. And the intent of it was to have the public build it. Didn't really work out. And we never really had the press in. And I realized that was a total missed opportunity. So then the next show we did was the living architecture. And I asked artists up front, would they be okay for a month of um, open studios? It was called work, working studios. That's where the kids were at, um, where they were they invited the public to help them make their work. And some people approach that differently, like Jan Tihi showed different versions of his projection and kind of just bounced off ideas with people. Other performed, they wanted that feedback. Other people, literally like one artist had a neon piece and she asked two people, I, this is gonna take three hours, would you help me build this frame? So um, I, and then the, 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 um, the one long table, that is totally my neighbors take that over. I, my original intent was from, oh, I forget which artist um, that I stole the idea from. And I wanted to have ta a table completely covering the entire street. And my neighbors are like, okay, you can do that next year. Let's get 20 tables from the city um, and we'll see how it goes, okay? And I was like, okay. And they um, are all volunteers and they manage it all. They clean up, they, you know, it, it's, they, the kids do the pace, uh, face painting, help with, we also do get an artist, but they help. So it's like the kids put up the signs. So it's really, um, like they look forward, the whole neighborhood kind of looks for it and it's kind of all hands on deck. Uh, and they actually clean it up and close it before I'm ever ready for it. It's like, what? And they're like, no, nope, it's over, got to clean up. I don't know if that really answers your question. It's kind of different approaches to what is a collective product. No, it absolutely did. I, I, was, I was really curious as to like how the, uh, educative exchange, like uh, how it extends outward into the community. Uh, and that was, uh, it was great. Um, do, are there any other questions from the audience? I know that uh, we, we, uh, we, we are kind of like doing a global thing because uh, Abe is in Berlin, <laughs> then Berlin time. And I, I, uh, so I was just wondering if there's, if there are any other questions uh, from the audience. Uh, um, Mark, may I ask a quick question sure. uh, of Abe? He, he, you um, talked a, a couple of times about your interview process. Do you have like a general template that you've developed that you use um, to make, you just remind yourself, you know, exactly what you're um, asking? And uh, how do you connect with, uh, actually there's two questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and how do you connect with those groups uh, in the Mississippi Delta area? Um, the, the first questions, um, no, I don't have a general template, but there is a lot of research that's done beforehand and uh, in, um, specifically knowing the, the area, the community, and um, the subject matter of interest with the person I'm going to be interviewing with and engaging with. And I, I, I largely allow the um, 
conversation to develop as organically as possible. Um, but also in, in uh, part of the reason why there's no template is I really prefer that the interviewee actually leads the narrative um, in the direction of how the conversation goes. Um, and I feel like you get more of a richer um, story, you get more richer content from them if it's um, you know a conversation that they're particularly interested in. Um, and the second question of how do I connect with the people in the Delta? Um, part of the reason why, um, besides just my own interest in it as well, part of the reason why it also developed as a podcast, it mater the research materialized as a podcast uh, and conversation series is um, one of the things I've found quite interesting peculiarly about working within that region of the United States is that, you know, when I first initiated the project, I would communicate with people with, with, through mediums that have become the normal um, mediums of communication, email, text, um, et cetera. Um, whereas, you know, it was really difficult to communicate with people um, via long distance um, that way, particularly in the South. Whereas um, once you show up or, you know, just kind of roaming around the South, people are so engaging and so um, immediately hospitable that they're really, and it became, you know, and it was a, it, it was a sort of culture that was quite familiar to me in West Africa as well. Um, in the sense where, you know, total strangers are just really interested in engaging with people and sharing stories and sharing that moment. You know, and so it became something special about how do you capture this very organic moment um, and not really construct it pre, uh, um, prefab it beforehand, but allow the, um, the moment and the spontaneous engagements to be the, the work and the methodology in, in the research itself. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Patrice, and thank you all. I think we could uh, wrap this up. Uh, that was that was a great conversation. Uh, I wanna, I, I think Nathan Smith from Roman Susan has left, but thanks Nathan Smith for also helping uh, or assisting with uh, uh, assembling this cast, uh, reconnecting with Thomas and introducing me to Tricia. So, uh, Thank you all. Uh, we will have another uh, uh, dialogue in a, uh, maybe a month and a half. We're, we're setting it up. So uh, we'll keep you posted on that. You yeah, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. This was great to catch up with everybody. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.